on behalf of aid society of india i welcome you all uh, this is going to be a 13th national conference of aid society of india which is starting in hyderabad from tomorrow and this is for the third time that we are organizing conference in hyderabad hyderabad the capital of telangana state and telangana state is one of the most hiv prone states in the country andhra pradesh telangana karnataka maharashtra and tamil nadu these five states uh, contribute around 80% of hiv cases in the country at the same time these are the five states where the response to hiv is also very good management of patients uh, testing tracking everything is going on well and when we organize conferences in it where in the south we get much better response than the conferences done in the north because hiv cases documented cases are not so many the practitioners in the field of hiv researchers in the field of hiv are also concentrated in the southern part of the country and that is the precise reason that for last couple of years we are alternating the conferences between hyderabad bangalore chennai mumbai and again it will come back to hyderabad maybe after 3 4 years so uh, this 3 days is going to be a um, i think um, one of the first conferences in the country which is face to face in last 2 and 1/2 years or 2 years uh, one of the conference happened was uh, pedicon or pediatric conference Uh, last week in delhi uh, or which is uh, um, ncr delhi and this is the second one in medical profession and one was in, uh, which is happening concurrently along with us in varanasi so welcome you all for the conference and we are expecting around 350 de- to be physically here and maybe more than 1000 delegates which will be virtual now when we were talking about 1000 or 500 we are thinking that we are exaggerating but one of the uh, sessions we had with omni curis which is a, one of the largest platform of cme in the country we had 12124 people attending online just about a month back and that was a, a cme organized by uh, uh, omac that is organized medicine academic guild of which aid society of india is a constituent and uh, that was a great success and then we realized that is a, a great importance to virtual also secondly lot of people who are not uh, part of the national uh, aids control organization or not of the uh, aids society of india they are in the neighboring countries they also can participate uh, virtually uh, there are a lot of countries where nothing much is happening um, and they are also depending on india not merely for medical uh, uh, kind of conferences or medical aid but lot of things they depend on india so sri lanka nepal Uh, bangladesh even pakistan despite our differences uh, myanmar they depend on india and lot of them are virtually registered to attend this conference so with this i uh, i would like to introduce my panelist here dr vijay eldandi is a scientific co-chair with the conference dr naval uh, chandra who is a professor at the nizam institute of medical sciences he is a, also scientific co-chair uh, my co-chair dr dilip mathai he is a dean of two medical colleges one of them is apollo medical college in Uh, hyderabad and dr jyoti dar uh, she is uh, you know, from uh, faculty uh, or international faculty she is from united kingdom and though she is from united kingdom she is always with us for all our conferences over to you dr eldandi so welcome and we are looking forward to a great conference we are, we will have lots of people from india but also a lot of people from outside india participating or many different areas hiv policy in india recent scientific advances as well as clinic in many different dimensions of hiv care and particularly now that covid hit us we will now realize the importance of having a robust and resilient public health system to address all of the health problems that everybody faces but in particular the most vulnerable people in our society of which unfortunately a large number of them are people with hiv and this past two years with covid has hit them particularly hard so this is a time for us all to regroup once again go over and address all of the problems that we face but also a time for us to compare notes of what has worked and amazingly the intrepid public health warriors in india have risen to the occasion and gone above and beyond the call of duty to support people living with hiv 
uh, Dr. Naval Chandra, please. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the state of Telangana, to the city of Hyderabad, Hyderabad being the city of pearls. Happy to say we are going all out physical. As Dr. Gilada sir said, that we are having more than 300, 350 registered delegates attending this conference. Odd, we expect over 1,000 odd uh, delegates signing in uh, uh, online. All I can say is uh, Hyderabad or the, city, or the state of Telangana, known for a pretty high incidence in the field of HIV. But I should congratulate the TSAC's uh, body, you know, for uh, conducting and having very good services rendered for people living with HIV in our state, and they're doing a very good job. Our center of excellence is providing good uh, ART care for uh, uh, all those in need. And uh, very well streamlined, we are seeing that you know a lot more people, uh, people living with HIV, are receiving their ARTs regularly and so forth. So it's good to uh, you know associate with all the SAC bodies of the country, the NACO, as being one of our main uh, partners, associate partners of uh, ASI. And I once again welcome all of you. I also wish to state we are going to have a couple of sessions of. COVID and tuberculosis. COVID, of course, being the you know the new pandemic, the pandemic we faced last two years, and what uh, you know our HIV patients went through in this pandemic, as long as COVID was concerned, and uh, of course tuberculosis being one of the most important comorbid uh, diseases with HIV, people living with HIV. So we're going to have a whole lot of sessions and topics with pertaining to these two uh, diseases too. Thank you very much and welcome uh, once again and looking forward to a great two and a half days of a, a great academic feast. Thank you. Dr. Jyoti Dabris. Um, I don't know how many of you have uh, looked at the, uh, the title or the motto of uh, this, this 13th uh, meeting, Confronting Pandemics with Proficiency, Precision and Persistence. And what I would say the last two years have taught us how to be proficient, how, how can we be precise, but most of all, how do we persist with what we have and how to live with it, okay? I can promise you, having had a long association with the group, with the team, first of all, I'd like, I'd like to congratulate the Governing Council for putting up, so, uh, it's, it'll be a feast for the next three days. So what I would say is, look at the program, uh, pick up, even if you're virtually, pick up what you feel is important for you and try your damnedest and your best to at least uh, listen to those talks. Um, there will be some uh, areas where you will uh, you realize that how art is being inculcated into the art of into medicine and that's probably what COVID taught us is how to be, how to um, uh, have a holistic approach to um, managing any disease. HIV has taught us a lot, but COVID has, I think, has taught us more. So I'd say, I don't think I need to add anything more than what the others have already said. Um, I would say, um, take part, enjoy the sessions, give us feedback, and let us know how to do things better the next time. Uh, this is our first attempt at a hybrid meeting for ASICON, and we want some feedback from you. Dr. Mathai. Dr. Dilip Mathai, please. <coughs> He's a Vice President of Aid Society of India, a local co-chair, and also professor and dean of infectious diseases at uh, Apollo Medical College. Thank you, thank you, and we are very happy to host this conference here, particularly because the world sees 7,000 HIV infections every day. And in India, we have 1,200 infections. Why is it still happening in this 2022? Secondly, we should all understand that there are only two infectious disease conditions that cannot be cured. One is rabies and the second is HIV. Of course, both these diseases can be 
controlled very well only if people are aware that either they've been bitten by a dog and come to for medical help or know that if they've got HIV, they can seek medical help. For if you are infected or not. Everybody was running for the point of care test for COVID. But nobody is running or even, you know, for a point of care testing for HIV. We also have currently in our armamentarium with those 25 drugs that we have, we have chosen or selected two drugs, which if when taken promptly or within a time duration of an accidental exposure to a possible situation where HIV transmission has, is likely to occur, it is preventable, almost to the extent of 99.9%. Thirdly, we have in this, I am preparing in 2030. One of the reasons is, of course, COVID, where we have had an increase uh, uh, in occurrence of TB, and I have a different view on why it has happened. Secondly, you will find that due to stigma and due to the inability of the patient to come to collect their medicines, we all believe, yes, I teach. We send by courier. We send the medicines. We ask them to come. But how effective is it? I'm waiting to see the, the, the situation post-COVID when people begin to analyze the resistance rates that have occurred or may have occurred. It's still conjectural or, you know, we still don't know. And uh, so we, we strongly believe that HIV is also on the increase. So you've got preventive measures, you've got patients taking drugs which are supplied free by the government. And yesterday when I was doing a, you can cut it, cut the conversation, but yesterday when I was doing a grand rounds on, on, on mortality and I was discussing with Neville also, a, a, a patient who was diagnosed to have HIV on regular antiretroviral therapy and Stop therapy for eight years and the 28 year old lady died in my hospital. I am a physician, a chubby physician and how on earth did I not know this happened? You know it is failure on the part of the physicians also not to ch chase them like uh, with the Army, Navy and the Air Force if they miss on a drug. It's not forgiving if you go diabetes you don't take the medicine it's forgiving, hypertension forgiving, but this disease is not forgiving if you miss doses for a certain period of time or don't take it. So you see, I don't know, with our uh, poverty, with our illiteracy, uh, with the uh, gender inequality, domestic violence, whatever it is, which way the whole control process of this HIV would occur. Now speaking from a medical college point of view, every medical college is supposed to have an ART center. And I want to place it on record that we medical colleges in the private sector are treated differently from a government medical college in terms of providing the facilities for the care of such patients. It's not that private medical colleges simply because we are private should not get the benefits, but we are all focusing on trying to solve the issue. That is minimize HIV or minimize TB. We don't have a tuberculosis center in, my, in a tertiary care hospital, in a, in a private medical college. What is happening? The private people would be treating differently from the government people. Now, why can't this come together? It's not, we're not charging any money, but the drugs can be made available. The investigation facilities can be made available. And I'm, I'm not taking it on to the government as such. Of course, condoms are useful in preventing most STIs, but still there are other STIs which could still be transmissible. So I think, and then and when, we are, when we have COVID, I didn't know this COVID as exposed 
the very poor infrastructure that we have in the country for health. Unless and until <laughs> they increase the health sp care spend, we are just not going to battle or improve the, uh, you know, the health status of our people. If you still look at it, we have one uh, calculation called daily, D-A-L-Y, disability as an, uh, an associated life years as such. Um, uh, tuberculosis is still the leading. Tuberculosis is still the leading. And you'll find TB and HIV. HIV is not the leading, but tuberculosis, you know, with 5% of the people having uh, HIV, you will find that that would also be a problem. So basically what we are trying to do in this conference is trying to bring about an awareness and also even, even the ones who know about it to see whether they can help out in the training, the teaching, the rolling out of the medicine. How many, I just want to end with one last statement, hepatitis B and C, how many of us doctors are treating? At hepatitis C, 95% of hepatitis C patients can be cured. Now, where is the great government? And every, and if you look at it, 0.5% of the blood bank donors are hepatitis C positive. A voluntary blood bank, uh, uh, voluntary donors of in the blood bank, 0.5%. We have. 18 million beds in the hospital, in the country. And we have almost 18, uh, 18, uh, sorry, 18 lakhs beds and almost 18 lakhs transfusions in the country. So if you look at it, you, the numbers may be this way, that way, but 0.5% of hepatitis C is a huge number. They're all walking around, not knowing what to do. So, I, so the conference is trying to bring about good awareness in all of these infectious disease situations because now most people are focusing on NCDs, non-communicable diseases. But time is still time is still not there to go in for a complete shift. But uh, you know, infectious disease with the preventable vaccines, 19 vaccines are available for the elderly, I'm calling myself elderly. <laughs> How many are we giving out? And so, so there's a lot to be done. And anyway, I'm so glad that the Aid Society has taken the, all the efforts to bring the conference to Hyderabad and Telangana. Even when we met the health minister yesterday, he was so keen on coming. But unfortunately, the dates clashed with this. Uh, is he still come, uh, come <laughs> clashed with He's this uh, tour. Uh, with this tour. Still, because he was also keen and interested in the health of the uh, state of Telangana. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, can, can I ask a yeah, question, please? Uh, if, if you want to say something. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to say something. Like, uh, basically, when any disease, which has more death rate, people are dying, people are suffering, that gets attention, both media attention, political attention, general attention. As soon as we are overcoming that problem, when we have a success story, people are not interested. Same thing has happened with HIV. Currently, HIV, if any patient comes to me, initially they are shocked. We tell them four things. Number one, you are not going to die. You are going to live full life. Like average life in India is 71 years for a female, 69 for male. You will live till that time. Number two, within three months, I will make you undetectable. So you will not infect your partner. Husband will not infect wife or wife will not infect husband. Number three, you can still have child and child will be HIV negative. And number four, you will not be hospitalized. All four things can be done just by one pill. And there are companies from India I must admire them that they managed to make all and currently 90% of ART or antiretroviral therapy in the world is manufactured in India and given to rest of the world. So today if Africans were not dying like ants which were dying earlier that is because of India. But this success story people are not interested. 
the moment people will say the 10000 deaths because of aids or covid or this headline ministers will be all going awry but the moment you say covid is controlled covid is not going to happen fourth wave is not going to come people are not interested the moment tomorrow you hear from cranky people like the iit in kanpur saying fourth wave is coming on 24 1st of jan june biggest headline where is that fourth wave how are you calculating who are you mathematician statistician this is governed by virus it is not governed by medical but that makes headline so unfortunate part is that success stories or success times are not real and lastly this conference we make so pure from 2005 is a no alcohol no smoking is conference policy and aids society of india is the first organization in the country to do that today medical council of india or now national medical commission ima all uh, dcgi etc all guidelines say no alcohol so i think we started that and lastly we try to combine everybody together we have pharma companies we have doctors we have researchers we have medical students post graduate student we have international and national faculty everybody stays in the same hotel total in house conference so that they concentrate in conference and that's the reason that our attendance whatever register people are there it is 75 to 80% in the hall so it is a fully academic we have at least 16 sessions almost 24 hours of uh, uh, cme going on continued regulation going on there are competitions among the postgraduate students which will be presenting oral presentations they will be having a poster presentation we would like to see that young more and more young people come and carry on uh, for future and uh, we are also trying to combine hiv tuberculosis covid hepatitis b hepatitis c and other emerging diseases today we may not know what diseases will come after 2 years 3 years so aid society of india will expand its horizon to encompass emerging and reemerging infectious diseases so that will also give some kind of impetus to young people to come and work in this field yes madam uh, no just yes. one more thing we should also be fair sided there are some success stories the success story is i don't know which states but kerala i know has got almost zero transmission if i i don't know the exact figure almost zero transmission of mother to child i think there's another state but it's not i know maybe goa i said yeah that's a great success story that means something is happening that we are screening them properly and advising them properly with the antiretroviral drug of course no doubt about it there is no i don't know of any unsafe blood transfusions as such happening in india that's also a big success story the third success story i think in the whole of uh, chavit care is of course uh, uh, the uh, how do i say it officially the clandestine people have come out into the uh, open. open yeah yeah <laughs> mass and population and, uh, yeah. so therefore you have a greater right. acceptance of them uh, in society that's a very big uh, uh, in a success story as such because we were always labeling them as uh, you know having a, that's a big success story and uh, things where we are improving on is gender equality you know everywhere uh, the starting with i don't know the sheep uh, 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 taxi system uh, sheep police stations Uh, etc gender equality and my wife can call me into the women's police station if i have to if i say anything against uh, her in other words the police in the women's po- we have an all women's police station have you got that in the uk no, no <laughs> only for women no. but wouldn't sorry but wouldn't you say that that is um, an, an impact or the yeah. outcome that you seeing from the education the awareness that people like you know the foot soldiers the people on the ground are you know years of it's not like a one day overnight yes. uh, success story it's the decades of work that you know people have been no, have put it also in. depends on the lady chief minister we had a lady chief minister in tamil nadu who insisted that we should have in each district one female uh you know police uh, once the police station manned by females and handling only female uh, related issues as such
Sorry, you wanted to? You know, I just wanted to ask a question. So uh, you rightly said that we will not be able to meet the targets uh, in terms of ending, say, DD, HIV, AIDS. And is, are we failing on prevention? Are we paying less attention to prevention, whether it be COVID-19 or whether it be TB or I, Yeah, I meant more on TB. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I'm talking but of all three. Not precisely on the uh, 1990 yes, uh, yes, statement. No. See, the, the problem in um, TB, okay. maybe my learned, more learned colleagues would also say, the problem in TB is, I, by the time I know that I have TB, I take about 54 days to come to the TB center. I'll be coughing, transmitting to everybody before I reach the center. If you really want to get at the TB patients, you have to go knocking at the doors. Knock, knock. How many in your house, household members have got cough? If you have, I think one will come out with cough. It's a very common, seventh most common symptom in, in, the, in, in a patient. And what, how, how long has it been persistent for? More than two weeks, which fulfills the criteria of the NTEP. Take the sputum then and there and test it. How good is the testing? Yes, good enough. Take two and then follow up and see whether the cough comes down. Unless you go knock knock, you will not be able to track all of them as such. That is the first failure step. The second failure step, second, second success story, I don't know if you have done it. It's a four-month therapy has yes, come. Yes, 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 it does. Yes. So that means I, I got time. Now I'm doing nine-month or six-month therapy. Yes. I, I will, for that mass, uh, I will be able to take care of two patients. Yes. Two patients uh, are with the time that I have and with the, the resources that I have. Yes. So, and that again is the rediscovery of the pharmaceutical company which brought down the prices of repapentate and of course moxicone. Only one company making in the whole world, yes. uh, McLeod. Yes, yes. And the price would be uh, minuscule. So rather than taking one tablet for 180 days, 12 tablet is over. over. Yeah. So you, you were asking, is it doable? I mean, has, haven't the last two years shown you that it is, anything is doable? When, yes. when people put their heads together, work as a team, it's doable. It's achievable. When the will, when there is a will, the government will for things to happen. I mean, the things that research protocols, you know, rules were flouted, regulations were flouted, that's because there was the government will for things to happen. I mean, I've never seen, you know, trials within days were established within the UK. Data was being pumped in. Recovery was set in within weeks of every NHS hospital was sounded that collective cohort activity was generated and everybody was contributing. So it's not, you know, your question was, isn't it doable? It is doable, but the resources that were pumped into it were enormous, absolutely. I mean, I found out yesterday that they're dumping billions of words of vaccine in the UK because it's out of date. I mean, it's all, money it's all resources and you know to to get you know to your point it is doable why not it, it, yesterday we had a discussion with one of the niti io people yes. i never knew this term pli production linked incentive okay. it's a new term that they brought so if you have a company that is manufacturing vaccines you uh, you know increase the uh, production will give you some incentive for that and drugs, uh, you know, fast tracking of this <coughs> manufacturing of this antiviral, um, this COVID antiviral drugs you manufacture quickly, I'll get, give you incentive. Similarly, I was just then, and um, in incentives for, if I complete a course of TB treatment, give either the dot treatment center or the patient direct transfer money, thousand rupees, you finish your treatment, I give you thousand rupees. My taxpayers' money going to clear TB will make my country safe for other people. So I suggested that the first Modi ji's monkey path. Okay. <laughs> he is very willing if you can send suggestions. I don't know whether it will surface to a presentation, but you can send anything. <laughs> you are. So, 
actually i was not talking about doable i was just wondering that to cut the chain of transmission for any infectious disease i think there needs to be more emphasis on prevention uh, I, that is the point yeah, that that's what is happened in the country what happened when you look at national aids control organizations national uh, aids uh, control policy or program the first phase was only education awareness second phase was education awareness plus blood safety plus uh, targeted intervention third phase came for treatment prevention is forgotten and fourth phase is treatment with uh, viral load testing with uh, this uh, hiv aids bill and all prevention activities are forgotten so what has happened in last 10 years the tempo of the campaign which was there which was in 2005 to 2010 and that time the young children which were just 5 year 10 year old now they have become 20 and mm-hmm. they have not seen major campaign they are risk takers so currently all new infections are in young people which are between 18 to 25 or 30 so our prevention campaigns are very poor targeted intervention is almost nullified sex workers program nullified then there are uh, tinder grinder this kind of uh, apps where people have dating apps and then <coughs> some of them are using prep but they don't know that prep is going to only prevent hiv not other studies so we are seeing emergence of uh, herpes and uh, what you call uh, uh, warts penile warts syphilis emerging like anything so going to be major problem so i think when any government or a private agency they move to the next step it doesn't mean that you forget the first step you you're talking about prevention the three greatest discoveries that brought down infectious disease one is uh, okay immunization two is antibiotics third is purification of water you know the fourth one which is equal into that is cessation of smoking uh, yes. you know that's also a great yes. preventive uh, measure of course addition of physical uh, activity to your today's proven addition of physical activity in whatever form increase your heart rate will enhance your yes. cardiovascular fitness and long, so called longevity uh, as such or retardation of aging uh, as such uh, when we talk about prevention in infectious disease or in this thing where is the government program for hpv vaccination yes, that's what i was about to say but dr saab hpv you are talking where the hpv vaccine is 3800 per vaccine there are no manufacturers in the country i am uh-huh. telling company people you manufacture vaccine bring it to 100 500 1000 people will take number one number two hepatitis b vaccine is less than 100 rupees per dose yeah and we all our every uh, blood bank is checking for hepatitis b every art center is checking for hepatitis b we know that hepatitis b is negative they can be help with the vaccine there are vaccination yeah. so yeah. currently universal vaccination program from 2011 onwards all children are given hepatitis b vaccine free of charge along with polio triple measles mumps etc but people who are born before that they are not given hepatitis b vaccine and nobody is talking about that see the so we have changed even in the in the uh, women maybe i'm not so very conversant but today self examination of the breast is taught for women below 40 and those who have got risk factors family history 10% you know etc now about the age of 40 the recommendation is not self examination but mammography no. and yearly or to, at least uh, once, once in two years once two yearly is the recommendation how many how many are, are following it you know and uh, uh, etc so see the, sorry the, the problem i see it being from an outsider is that we know certain things work you don't need evidence because the evidence is being provided to you you know we know um, our what clinics we would run what clinics have dried up it's a rarity now if somebody it's only the the chronic the older people who have got recurrent what what we don't see what's anymore it's something that probably they'll be seeing in pictures why because introduction of hpv vaccination we know prep works you know uk is probably going to be one of the first yes. countries where declining levels to nearly zero and maybe we'll be there earlier than was predicted because we didn't 
wait that to see whether PrEP was effective or not. Now we are fine-tuning it, how to make it better, how to make it user-friendly. So these are, the th these are the problems that, you know, I see happening here is that, okay, you know that this works, implement it. You know, okay, you've diagnosed, you've left somebody on antiretrovirals. How do, they, how do you retain them in care? That's a big issue. That's a mega issue. You know, and that's what I meant by introducing art into medicine, is that um, we know what works. Just individualize it to that person. And I, as a teacher and a trainer, and you know, that's what I tell my students. I say, the science is there. Even the patient can Google what is the treat, what is PrEP. But how do I retain this person who doesn't, who you missed for 20, you know, who died? How do I retain this woman in, into care? And what do I do as a healthcare worker Hello? to yeah, tell me. manage them? Because everybody is different. I'll be doing a talk on adolescent. Yeah, yeah, and, me. I mean, and I'll be talking about a case. And for me, that case embodies. I already, I already my sent you. Uh, did did I send you the note? Work I, uh, prepared or should I send Because you? patients teach you. They teach you how to. I I didn't know what to do, but you learn from uh, one. It you know, block. you see it uh, works. Yeah, I mean, uh, you implement it. It don't work is fine. It don't work okay. is fine. So I, that's I, I, the, the issue I see with in in this in, in okay, this fine. country. It's not that prevention. We all know prevention works. I mean, it's like teaching people to suck eggs. You know, we don't need to do that. It's just how do we make it happen? And that's what I meant when I said that if you have the will, if there's a governmental will to, to make it happen, it'll happen. And that's what COVID taught us. Forget everything else. You know, it's got to be. We've got to stop people from dying. I think uh, overall the preventive health is a weaker part of society. Promotive health is a bigger part. Tertiary care is a bigger part. More budget is for tertiary care. Very less budget for primary care. You know, I remember in 19... Isn't, isn't it our job as in, clinicians? In 1985 when I started HIV awareness and I was going to red light areas that's what I'm saying. and started distributing condom to sex workers, our own people saying that, what are you doing, Dr. Why are you doing this thing? I said, why? Are, if you distribute condom, if they use condom, STD will go down. How will we practice? How will we survive? <laughs> now, if this is the attitude of people, yeah. the, how, do, how do we have a preventive health? So, preventive health has been weak. Fortunately, India has done very well in preventive immunization for polio, smallpox, triple. So, all this is very well done. And uh, the, that example can be used for COVID because uh, COVID vaccination is uh, it goes side by side with top COVID cases. If COVID cases go down, people don't want to take vaccine. So same thing we would like to tell people that when you have a fire brigade in your town, you don't have to have fire every time. Fire brigade is always required. You don't know when fire will be there. And polio, hardly we get two or three cases uh, once in uh, 10 years. Still we take a polio vaccine. So preventive health should not be forgotten. So vaccination is important for wherever it is available. And uh, wherever it is costly, that should be made affordable. Wherever it is only patent donor companies are making and making a lot of money, Indian company should come. Whether it's a, a Nemovax vaccine, whether it's a HPV vaccine, they should make Indian vaccines available and India can do it. India has already shown. Yeah. You know, speaking on primary care, immediately after this conference, we have the family medicine conference at Apollo. And there, in that in the topic list, not a single topic on uh, HIV and uh, STDs as such, family medicine. And uh, the, uh, anyway, I'm speaking there on antimicrobial stewardship. The biggest problem today in India is antimicrobial resistance. Because for anything, gale me kich kich antibiotic. Mm -hmm. huh? And I don't know what is the problem in STDs. And uh, COVID has created more resistance for uh, azithromycin doxycycline. Yeah. <clears throat> and that has cost, and that again, in, you will be seeing it in STIs. I don't have Hi. personally much experience in STI uh, and such, but you see the gonotoxin being resistant to those who call them penicillin. Uh, Sorry. So, for the benefit of uh, 
those who have come now, I will introduce the panel. Yeah. I am myself, Dr. Ishwar Gilada, President of AIDS Society of India and Governing Council Member of the International AIDS Society. Dr. Naval Chandra is a professor at NIMS and he is a Joint Secretary of ASI and he is a local co-chair and scientific co-chair for the ASICON. Dr. Vijay Eldandi is a professor at the University of Illinois in Chicago and he is also in charge of Share India, uh, NGO in India and he is a scientific co-chair for the conference. Dr. Jyoti Dhar is our international faculty coming from UK and she has been coming to almost all the ASICONs irrespective of wherever it is and whenever it is. And Dr. Uh, Dilip Mathai is a dean of two medical colleges, Apollo Medical College in Mumbai, uh, in uh, not Mumbai, uh, being in Mumbai, always talk Mumbai, Hyderabad and which is that place? Chittur. Chittur. <laughs> Chittur. And uh, he is uh, also uh, the local co-chair for the uh, ASICON, which is starting from tomorrow. Uh, Madam and uh, Bobby, they are from CNS News Service and they have been assisting us for last almost 15 years for all our meetings, conferences, year around. And they have done wonderful job for the COVID. And I also admire our team uh, who are here and who are all over the country that they have all worked during COVID, for COVID. Because there is, there is nobody who is a COVID specialist. COVID is a new disease. So we told our people that you are HIV specialist, you are infectious disease specialist, you are STD specialist, you are chest physician, work for COVID. Everybody work for COVID. Not a single holiday. So I think after two and a half years, we are meeting face to face. And just one point, I am very glad, Dr. Mathai, that you brought up the issue of adult immunization in India. Adult immunization in India. Adult immunization. Because there is hardly, uh, absolutely zero stress. I, I am a senior citizen. Yeah. And even when I go to doctors to ask, why do you need a flu vaccine? Why do you need a pneumonia vaccine? I think... Uh, there needs to be more awareness uh, on adult immunization. I think a lot many people are dying yeah. of, uh, uh, senior but citizens are dying of pneumonia. Vaccine preventable cases. Yes, yes, vaccine yes. preventable. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it's also, uh, of course, pregnancy related vaccines, cheap, uh, mm -hmm. not expensive. Um, um, uh, vaccines for heart and uh, umrah mm -hmm. okay it's expensive but compared to the travel cost of an airline ticket it is not expensive uh, but um, so they can take new bags and some of them take hepatitis b and all the other vaccines but when they are not going for hajj or umrah hello it's expensive and uh, uh, for, for me, and now, or hardly ever have a live TV program. For me, every program. year so I have to hard. take no, 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 not every year. Every year I have to take what is the flu vaccine. So that cost me two thousand five hundred. Um, uh, and uh, of course, I am shortly to I have to take herpes zoster. I was about to say that they give you zoster. Herpes zoster is another, you know, two thousand five hundred. It's five thousand. Of course, I've already taken my pneumovax. Otherwise, if I had not taken that, another uh, five thousand. But would and you say? Uh, would you say as the huh? as this? Would you say that as a senior citizen, they have more disposable income, and probably they would take it and do it probably if only they yes. were aware of. Yes. Yes. So, who is it? Who is the person yeah. who tells them uh, you need a flu jab? Like I, I, I called my parents and told them, you yeah. need a flu jab, you need a pneumococcal. Yeah. So in the same way, what I'm saying is, who are these, you know, who will signpost these individuals that you're talking about? Because that's the job of healthcare professionals, isn't no. it? No, no, you must understand it in the context of Indian uh, economic. Pardon me if I'm not making an official statement. Less than 1% or 1.5% of Indian population pay taxes. Now, what does that mean? Affordability is only among this 1.5 percent. The, we have started an immunization clinic. I told you 19, and I'll give you my uh, references on that. Uh, 19 vaccinations that are there. It, it's, it's in the third floor. Mm. Which older person will come to the third floor to get that vaccine? You know, you have to make it available like uh, Almost like the public toilets that are available. 
Otherwise, we're not going to reach that even I Sir, excuse me. I want to know what is confronting pandemic proficiency, precision, and persistence. Mm -hmm. What exactly is that? You see, confronting pandemics is because for the first time, this ASICON, which is being organized, not only focusing HIV, but also focusing HIV, tuberculosis, and newer pandemics like COVID. So there's an agenda for COVID also in this conference. Usually we have HIV and co-infections like uh, uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and tuberculosis. The proficiency is efficiency plus professionalism. So we would need people who are properly trained. And that is the entire purpose of Aid Society of India, doing a national conference every year once. And all over the year, we do a lot of CMEs, Pan-India. So we try to partner with other conferences also, uh, which are of different nature, like say, tuberculosis conference, or a chest physicians conference, or pediatric conference. We are going to have a part of it. But we also do a lot of training program for young people. And uh, precision and persistence, because we are all uh, almost 35 years, 30 years, 25 years in HIV. So only with persistence we can overcome. We have seen in COVID there are a lot of fly-by-night operators. Everybody became COVID expert. And after some time they vanish. But in HIV we didn't do that. We are, whether HIV is up or down or control, we are there. So this kind of persistence is required. And then only we can overcome all this pandemic. So this kind of effort where we have uh, medical professionals, pharma companies, postgraduate doctors, researchers, everybody under one platform and going to be at the part of the conference. So tell me what is the status of uh, AIDS in India after so many decades? Yeah, yes, State of HIV? Yes. Very well managed. Uh, we must appreciate uh, National AIDS Control Organization and Government of India for three things. Uh, at least a lot of good things happened in 2017. Number one, the HIV AIDS Act 2017, which was going on for the last 20 years, has been passed as a bill. It is a currently toothless act. Not a single person is prosecuted under the act. But at least there is an act. So that anybody who is uh, discriminated or human right violated, they can have that act to be used where anybody who is a perpetrator can be jailed for two years. Any doctor, any hospital not providing care to HIV positive person can be jailed. So this provision is there. Number two, the government of India for the first time started viral load testing. Earlier viral load testing was not a part of uh, program. So if you are treating somebody, but you don't know whether that treatment is successful or not. And they were initially saying that viral load is very expensive, but they had a public-private partnership, the cost was brought down, and they started testing. Number three, under test and treat, they started dolutegravir based regimen. So DTG is one of the best drug anybody could see. And today, if you bring a person with HIV, who is having a per ml blood 2 crore virus, within three months, along with this dolutegravir and two other medicine, one single tablet, I can make that person undetectable. And the principle is undetectable is untransmittable. So in person, if you cannot detect the virus, that person cannot transmit the virus. So these things are very well done. All over the country, there are 1000 plus ART centers. So anybody who cannot afford anything, they can still go to ART center, get free treatment. And whether the person goes to a free ART center or private ART uh, physician, treatment is same, which was basically uh, what was there in the country. Uh, those who have money, they can buy better health, and those who have no money have poor health. Huh? We used to say always that uh, uh, because if you have a lot of money, you can get best health. Uh, uh, we used to say is the survival for the richest, for others die early is the best. But here, whether it's the richest or poorest, they get the same treatment. So this is admirable, and therefore, what has been done? New infection rate has been flattened. But what has happened is prevention campaign is poorer. Intervention campaign with the sex workers is poorer. Mm. Male sex with male, though it has been recognized, now opened up, but the prevention campaign is poorer. Therefore, your infections are coming young people between 18 to 25, 18 to 30, because those young people, 10 years before when the campaign was very high, they were very young. They didn't understand what is HIV. So we need to emphasize that when we go to the next stage, we should not forget the first stages, mm. prevention and intervention. Mm -hmm. The, I, I mean, this is something that I feel that um, that the media doesn't do well enough or where they lack behind many other countries globally. The Indian media is 
spreading the message of you is equal to you. Okay, what does that mean? What Dr. Hilada said a few minutes ago is that, that if your virus is not detectable in your blood, you cannot pass it on to another person. And this is, there really, we should, there should be a campaign nationally spreading this message across because by doing that, we would remove a lot of stigma. We would remove a lot of um, hypocrisy that is, surrounds this whole thing about AIDS. And I, I don't mean to be rude or I don't want to be mean, but when you asked Dr. Hilada a question, you said to him, what is the situation of AIDS in this country? I mean, we, AIDS hasn't existed in India for nearly 20 years now. I mean, people don't get AIDS if they are on antiretroviral drugs or on HIV drugs, okay? So AIDS, there is no AIDS. It's only the untreated, the person who is undiagnosed and who is not treated with antiretrovirals who gets AIDS, okay? So therefore, that's where I feel the media also, you all have a responsibility to hone in that message, to pass that message to the common person. I mean, the healthcare professionals will do their job. But at the end of the day, until that sense of awareness is, goes to the common person, that I'm not, this person is not going to give me HIV because he or she is on drugs. You know, I think that's where, you know, you're lacking in your responsibility as well of sending that positive message because all you get in, in the media from, even today from HIV is negativity. It's a lot of negativity. That positive message, I hardly ever see that positive message. No, no, experts like you should bring awareness to the media by training, interaction. No, no, media, I, mean, media I, I will media. tell you, earlier we used to say that positive people should marry with only positive. In last five years, more positive and negative marriages are happening with an understanding that somebody is positive, fine, no problem. If you're saying the treatment makes him undetectable, I will not get HIV, fine. Yeah. So there are more marriages happening between positive and negative people. So there's a very positive sign. Mm -hmm. And, and there, uh, it's not marriages means marriage for today and again tomorrow divorce. They are sustaining marriages. The HIV conference has started, no? You are at home now. Any more questions? Thank you. You are all invited for dinner at the poolside. And I also invite you to be at the conference for three days. You interact with people, both internationally.